Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. An NBC News left field special report says that hams could save our lives in a disaster. A Canadian radio amateur finds a resurrected NASA satellite. An anticipated new building won't be ready for Hamvention 2018, but the flea market will be expanded. The 3YOZ Beauvais Island de-expedition is aborted over safety concerns. The AWRL comments on Technological Advisory Council Spectrum Policy Recommendations. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration seeks comments on discontinuing WWV and WWVH marine storm warnings. The AWRL suggests that the FCC may need to intervene to ensure effective antenna rights. There's a brand new D-Star satellite in orbit. And what is Elon Musk planning to do to top the roadster and spaceman in space? We'll tell you all about the next project for SpaceX in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, says that the future is here. You just can't see it. And he'll also tell you how to keep your computer safe on the Internet. Australia's own Ono Ben Shop, VK6FLAB, will be here to tell us about antenna gain and polar chart magic. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here with a long-lost edition of his Amateur Radio History Headlines. And in a Rain Report special, we'll hear a talk from Fred Hoppengarten, K1VR, about PRB1 and Deeds, Covenants, and Restrictions. That's all straight ahead as edition number 989 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio facility in the frozen tundra of upstate New York, I'm W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from the dead of winter in the Catskill Mountains, where snow continues to fall but rain is forecast, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. Reporting from the News Bureau in Franklin, Indiana, where it's finally above freezing, I'm Amy Jo Clark. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. A team from NBC News's Nascent Digital News Unit left field was in Hawaii to visit with some radio amateurs to produce a report when the false nuclear missile alert happened on January 13th. Left Field's report points out how much we rely on cell phones and 21st century technology and what we would do if these suddenly were no longer available. Amateur radio operators are standing at the ready and may save us all, NBC Left Field said in the tease to its YouTube version of its report. Accessible directly from NBC News, the report with Left Field's Jacob Sorboff runs a little over seven minutes. Ham radio is one of the ways you'd be able to hear what's happening when conventional telecommunication systems fail, Sorboff told his viewers. Among those interviewed in the piece are ARRL section manager Joe Speroni, AH0A, and section emergency coordinator Kevin Bogan, AH6QQ. NBC News says its left field unit is a new internationally minded video troupe that makes short creative documentaries and features specially designed for social media and set top boxes. When he's not on ham radio, Scott Tilly, VA7TIL, an amateur astronomer, hunts spy satellites. Using an S band radio from his home in Roberts Creek, British Columbia, Tilly routinely scans the skies for radio signals from classified objects orbiting the Earth according to a recent article in spaceweather.com. Since starting five years ago, Tilly has located dozens of secret or unlisted satellites. Earlier this month, while hunting for Zuma, an undisclosed U.S. government spacecraft lost on a January 8th launch mishap, he saw the signature of IMAGE, or the imager for the Magnetopause to Aurora Global Exploration Satellite, a NASA spacecraft believed to have died in December of 2005. The discovery has delighted space scientists. The long gone and nearly forgotten image spacecraft has come back to life and has been detected by an amateur astronomer, said mission manager Richard J. Burley at NASA's Goddard Space Flight, 
which confirmed that Tilly had spotted is indeed the image bird. Amateur observer Paul Marsh, M0EYT, in the UK, provided the first independent confirmation of the image signal. NASA said on January 29th that observations from five sites were consistent with the RF characteristics expected of image. Specifically, the radio frequency showed a spike at the expected center frequency, as well as sidebands where they should be for image. Oscillation of the signal was also consistent with the last known spin rate for the satellite. But just to make certain beyond a shadow of a doubt, NASA will next attempt to capture and analyze data from the ground. The challenge to decoding the signal is primarily technical. The types of hardware and operating systems used in the Image Mission Operations Center no longer exist, and other systems have been updated several versions beyond what they were at the time, requiring significant reverse engineering now. If data decoding succeeds, NASA will try and turn on the space station payload to understand the status of the various science instruments on board. After the spacecraft went silent, an unsuccessful 2007 effort was made to track image in the hopes that a long shadow encounter would drain the battery enough to cause the image computer to reset its control hardware. When that effort failed, the mission was declared to have ended. Space scientists now theorize that even longer eclipse or other event did reset the system and bring the transmitter back to life. Yet to be determined is whether it's possible to restore image to operation and to what degree. Launched in 2000 on a mission to monitor space weather, image mapped plasma patterns around Earth, kept tabs on the planet's magnetosphere as it responded to solar activity. Onboard ultraviolet cameras shot images of the Earth's auroras. It had the capabilities that no other spacecraft could match before or since, said Patricia Reif, a member of the original image science team. If revival occurs, the mission would be able to continue as before with no limitations, NASA's Image Failure Review Board said in its 2006 report. Reif said scientists stopped listening after the 2007 effort failed. After seeing the radio signature, Tilly used a program called SDRF to identify it. SDRF deduces the orbital elements from the Doppler shifts of their radio signals, and it immediately matched what Tilly saw to image. Rife said UC Berkeley still has a ground station that was used for real-time tracking and control and is scrambling to find the old software to see if it can get the spacecraft to respond. Image's global-scale auroral imager would be fantastic now for forecasting space weather, Rife said, with her fingers crossed. The 3Y0Z Bouvet Island de-expedition website still invites visitors to follow our story here. But that story took a disappointing turn on February the 3rd when the long-anticipated and costly de-expedition was abruptly aborted, even as the Batanzos, the vessel that had transported the de-expedition team from Chile, sat at anchor in full view of the remote South Atlantic island where they'd hoped to operate. The de-expedition team had arrived just a couple of days earlier and was awaiting the opportunity to transport the team and equipment to the island by helicopter. Here with more details in the story is Carla Perara, KC1 HSX, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. To the disappointment of thousands of amateurs, the Bouvet Island de-expedition was canceled on February 3rd. The team and their ship, the Batanzos, came within full view of the island, but luck was not on their side. According to an announcement on the Bouvet website, quote, During the last 72 hours, we continue to experience the high winds, low clouds, fog, and rough seas that have prevented helicopter operations since our arrival at Bouvet. No improvement was predicted in the weather forecast for the next four days. Then last night, an issue developed in one of the ship's engines. This morning, the captain of the vessel declared it unsafe to continue with our project and aborted the de-expedition. We are now on our long voyage back to Punta Arenas. As you might imagine, the team is deeply disappointed but safe. There is already talk about rescheduling the de-expedition." On February 5th, the team co-leaders, Bob Alfin, K4UEE, Ralph Fedor, K0IR, and Erling Wig, LA6VM, announced a change in itinerary. Quote, Our captain has decided that it is in the best interest of safety and expediency to proceed directly to Cape Town, South Africa, rather than Punta Arenas, Chile. We are now heading north to avoid the possibility of encountering ice. Close quote. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. Most of the team members were reported resting in their bunks and in good spirits. A little later that same day, Fedor reported that the Patanzos had passed through some ice, but that the seas then cleared. He said the voyage was considerably smoother than earlier in the day. 
We are, of course, very, very disappointed, Fedora said. We are slowed, but safe. The cost of the 3Y0ZD expedition approached $750,000, about half of that coming from 20 team members. Top operators from several nations with considerable de-expedition experience. In the planning stages for two years, the de-expedition had attracted contributions large and small from clubs and individuals around the world, including $100,000 from the Northern California DX Foundation, its largest grant ever, as well as an ARRL Colvin Award and a Yasme Foundation grant. A dependency of Norway, Bouvet is the third most wanted DXCC entity. The last Bouvet activation was 3Y0E over the winter of 2007 to 2008. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Commenting in response to an FCC public notice released last month, ARRL addressed the extent of amateur radio's response to recent hurricane disasters and efforts needed to expand the use of amateur radio services when it comes to planning, testing, and providing emergency communication. The comments point out that amateur radio not only has been far more than a hobby, it is a ubiquitous infrastructure independent communication resource that's always ready to deploy effectively whenever and wherever needed. The League cited the remarks of former FEMA Administrator Craig Fugate, KK4INZ, that amateur radio, quote, oftentimes is our last line of defense, close quote. ARRL raised three areas where action by the FCC could ensure and enhance the ability of radio amateurs to provide emergency communications, including the current Amateur Radio Parity Act of 2017, now in the U.S. Senate. ARRL noted in its comments, quote, Homeowner associations can preclude amateur antennas in common areas. HOAs can enact reasonable written rules governing height, location, size, and aesthetic impact of, and installation requirements for, outdoor antennas and support structures for amateur communications. But the effective outdoor antenna requirement is paramount. The bill is currently before the Senate Commerce Committee. If, however, Congress is unable, as has been rumored, to pass any telecommunications legislation this term, it will be incumbent on the Commission to take action on its own initiative that would be called for by this legislation. The future of amateur radio emergency communications is dependent on it." Close quote. Another issue that might call for some regulatory involvement by the FCC, ARRL said, relates to an outdated regulation that limits data rates in HF amateur communications, precluding certain digital emissions that have recently proven extremely important in amateur radio hurricane relief efforts. ARRL noted that the FCC has yet to act on the League's Petition for Rulemaking, RM11708, filed in November of 2013, proposing to amend the amateur service rules to eliminate the symbol rate limit relative to data emissions and allocations below 29.7 MHz. The petition called for establishing a 2.8 kHz maximum occupied bandwidth for data emissions in those bands. ARRL has argued that this deregulatory action is necessary to allow the use of Pactor 4, an effective and efficient digital communication mode that has proven valuable in disaster relief efforts. In July of 2016, the Commission released a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking in WT Docket 16239, proposing only to remove limitations on the symbol rate applicable to data emissions. Due to circumstances beyond their control, Hamvention 2018 organizers reluctantly are walking back an earlier announcement that a new building would be available for this year's event at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Zinnia, Ohio. Despite all the best efforts and intentions by Greene County, the Greene County Agricultural Society and Hamvention, we have learned the anticipated new building will not be constructed in time for Hamvention 2018, Hamvention General Chair Ron Kramer, KD8ENJ said. The prefab sections bid on and architecturally required are currently backlogged. We expect construction to be delayed until after our show at the Greene County Fair. Kramer said constructions should be completed this year in time for Hamvention 2019. We regret this. However, it is well out of our control, Kramer said. On the plus side, he continued, Hamvention 2018 will have more room for inside exhibits with the addition of the vacated furniture building and the flea market may gain new space as well. After consultation with professionals, we are in the process of solving the mud issue in the flea market area, Kramer said. 
We anticipate work to start as soon as weather allows. We are rearranging the soccer field parking to eliminate use of the low areas where we had problems last year. A revised exit plan and additional off-site parking also are in the works, along with easy-to-use maps to help visitors to navigate. Parking and shuttles will be free. Talk-in also has new equipment and a taller tower to extend its reach. There are many new ideas we are working on to make your stay with us more enjoyable, Kramer added. Keep watching the Hamvention website for updates. In comments to the FCC on a series of Technological Advisory Council, or TAC, Spectrum Management Policy Recommendations, the ARRL said that while some of the Council's recommendations are valid, it would be highly inappropriate to generalize about applying them broadly in all radio services. Here with more details on this story is Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. The comments, filed on January 31st, were in response to a December 1, 2017 public notice docket in ET docket number 17-340. ARRL took the opportunity to strongly urge the FCC to reinstate a 2016 Technological Advisory Council noise floor study, which ARRL asserted was apparently terminated before it even got started. ARRL reiterated its encouragement for the FCC to incorporate receiver performance specifications into U.S. spectrum policy on a broader basis. ARRL argued, however, that the amateur service should not be subject to receiver immunity standards because licensees employ a wide range of propagation, emissions, bandwidths, power levels, receivers, and antennas, making any receiver performance standards arbitrary and compromising the service's experimental nature. ARRL said that while the Technological Advisory Council's allocation principles include overgeneralizations, the Council is very much on the right track with such concepts as receiver immunity standards for certain radio services, including those that regulate consumer electronics. ARRL also supported the creation of a public database of past radio-related enforcement activities. What little FCC enforcement is necessary in the amateur service must be timely and visible, ARRL said. But ARRL returned to its assertion that a knowledge database regarding ambient noise levels in certain environments must be in place before adopting any next-generation spectrum management techniques. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1HSX. Indeed, it's difficult to imagine how the Commission can now suggest the adoption of specific spectrum management principles, incorporating such concepts as receiver immunity, HCTs or harm claim thresholds, and interference temperature determinations without having a firm grasp on ambient noise levels in basic RF environments and geographical areas, the League told the FCC. ARRL accepts that increased spectrum user density is the inevitable result of new wireless services, the League said. Given that this intensification of the use of the radio spectrum will necessitate a few new overlays of the similar radio services in increasingly shared spectrum, it's necessary to depart from the traditional regulatory model that the Commission has utilized for spectrum allocations. That model, the ARRL said, has almost without exception placed limits only on transmitters, while the inability of some receivers to reject out-of-band signals constrains new allocations in adjacent bands. This calls for what the ARRL called a holistic approach to transmitter and receiver performance. Requiring better performance from receivers or RF-susceptible devices is a valid, reasonable, and long overdue requirement, the League said. But the major goal of doing so should be to prevent instances of interference, not solely to allow the overlay of otherwise incompatible sharing partners in deployed spectrum to the detriment of incumbents. The League said that hams are able to differentiate between interference from nearby spurious or out-of-band signals and that caused by receiver deficiencies. The harm claim threshold concept does not fit the amateur service well either, the League said. Any interference hams suffer from each other is resolved cooperatively. Brute force overload also occurs occasionally, but is resolved by licensees without FCC intervention. Receiver immunity is not an interest service issue in the amateur service, ARRL said. The issue is, rather, protection from spurious and out-of-band emissions from other services. ARRL has supported the creation of a public database of past radio-related enforcement activities. Given the very limited and recently severely diminished availability of FCC field enforcement resources, 
it's urgent to publicize those enforcement actions that pertain to intentional or harmful interference in order to maximize the deterrence value of each one, the league said. The longer a licensee gets away with violating the rules without visible FCC sanction, the more the violator is encouraged to continue the behavior, which others then may imitate. What little FCC enforcement is necessary must be timely and visible, said ARRL. ARRL really turned, though, to its assertion that adopting any next-generation spectrum management technique, such as those that TAC recommends, presupposes the existence of a knowledge database regarding ambient noise levels in certain environments. Sadly, that information does not exist, and it won't any time soon, ARRL said, because the FCC took the TAC off the noise study project. That, in ARRL's view, is a big mistake, the League contended. No system of spectrum management incorporating ham claim thresholds and receiver immunity levels can be accurately implemented without the noise study data. That study is more important now than ever before, the ARRL concluded, and it is increasingly urgent as a prerequisite for any new spectrum management policies. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. Speaking on behalf of the WSJTX development team, Joe Taylor, K1JT, has issued a progress report on the team's efforts to develop FT8 de-expedition mode. The new digital mode will include new and innovative features, which are detailed in a draft FT8 de-expedition mode user guide released on February 2nd. Here with further details, reporting from ARRL headquarters is Carla Perara, KC1HSX. Taylor said the basic goal of FT8 de-expedition mode is to enable de-expeditions to make FT8 QSOs at the highest possible rates. And the WSJTX development team has been working with members of the Baker Island KH1KH7Z de-expedition team ahead of its midsummer operation to work out the wrinkles. Taylor said, quote, like most major de-expeditions, this one will almost certainly make a majority of its QSOs using SSB and CW. However, the group is well aware of the rapid rise of FT8 popularity, and they plan to use FT8 as well. Making FT8 QSOs with KH1, KH7Z will require the de-expedition and everyone trying to work with them to use a new, yet-to-be-released version of WSJTX. We have tested the new program features on the air several times and found them to work well." Close quote. In FT8 de-expedition mode, a de-expedition station is the fox and calling stations are the hounds. The new mode permits contacts to be completed with as little as one fox transmission per contact. The fox also can transmit up to five signals simultaneously, upping the potential contact rate to 600 per hour. The user guide points out that FT8 de-expedition mode is suitable for use only by legitimate de-expedition stations and by those attempting to work them and should not be used for day-to-day -day FT8 operation. Taylor said he hopes the development team's approach to FT8 de-expedition mode will continue the process of, quote, shaking bugs out of the program, unquote, and generally improve its usability for de-expedition operators and DXers alike. Another test run of the new mode will probably be scheduled in a month or so, Taylor continued, adding that others subsequently will be invited to upgrade to a release candidate called WSJTX version 1.9.0 release candidate 1 and to join in trying to work one or more specific pseudo de-expedition stations at a certain time and frequency. WSJTX release candidate versions identified by an RCX suffix are offered temporarily for beta testing but are not suitable for long-term general use. NOAA is once again considering ending North Atlantic and North Pacific Marine storm warning announcements at minutes 8, 9, and 10 of each hour on WWV and minutes 48, 49, 50, and 51 of WWVH. Submit questions, comments, or concerns about this proposed change with NIST Marine Warning in the subject line no later than February 23, 2018. NOAA had announced in April 2017 that it was considering this change, but held off in the wake of supporting comments. WWV and WWVH are services of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Also, the FCC would like to hear from amateurs about emergency response to last year's hurricane season, which included four hurricanes to hit the U.S. and Puerto Rico. The agency's Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau was receiving public comments until the 22nd of January and is now awaiting reply comments, which are due no later than the 21st of February. 
The notice, which is on the FCC website, is PS docket number 17-344. Comments are being sought on broadcasters' response, government agency response, and, of course, amateur radio response. The FCC is looking for answers in particular as to whether ham radio services should be increased to assist in the planning, testing, and delivery of emergency response and recovery communications. For assistance in filing your comments online, call the FCC's electronic comment filing system at 202-418-0193. That's 202-418-0193. You can also file directly from the website at FCC.gov forward slash ECFS. A Soyuz rocket launched D-Star-1 Phoenix and 10 other satellites into orbit on February 1st from the Vostochny Cosmodrome in Russia. Developed by German Orbital Systems in Berlin in cooperation with the Czech company iSky Technology, D-Star-1 Phoenix carries an amateur radio relay payload with a call sign of DP-1GOS. It replaces D-Star-1 nanosatellite that failed to attain orbit following a November Soyuz launch from Bastochny. Downlink frequencies are 435.700 MHz for telemetry and 435.525 MHz for D-Star. The uplink is 437.325 MHz. D-Star-1 Phoenix is a 3U CubeSat equipped with four identical radio modules with D-Star capability operating in half-duplex mode with a power output of 800 milliwatts. The two telemetry and telecommand modules both receive and both in sequence, so each telemetry frame is repeated. The other two modules are dedicated to amateur radio, although only one will operate at a time. The modules are configured to work as D-Star repeaters, so they retransmit received D-Star frames on the downlink frequency. They also have a D-Star voice beacon. Are you ready for another trip? Into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. I'm Steve Ford, WB at IMY, and I'm talking with Bart Yonke, W9JJ, the contest branch manager. And uh, Bart, how are things going? This is our first status report for the ARRL International Grid Chase. It's amazing, Steve, and we're already into the month of February on On the Air Contacts, and we're still gathering statistics from the month of January. It's been an exciting and busy month of January, uh, both from International Grid Chase standpoint as well as the fact that we have a number of contests and the expeditions taking place during the month of January. All of those people uploading their logs, all of those logs going into Logbook of the World, uh, where those participants chose to do so. And they've been uh, filling the International Grid Chase database with some terrific numbers. During the month of January, uh, to date reported so far, and by the way, the cutoff is going to be this Saturday, February 10th at 2359 Zulu. That's the cutoff for January activity. So be sure to upload your logs by that point to be in the January statistics. So far, what we've seen for January participants, these are the number of logbook account participants. In other words, if you participated in logbook and you've got multiple station locations, maybe you have a primary and a portable, each one of those accounted separately. So if you will, logbook accounts equal separate station locations. And we have 21,808 participants that have reported so far during the month of January. As an interesting side note, so far we're seven days into February and there's been 11,024 participants submitting. I will uh, point out that because the chase for grids is the strongest at the beginning of the month, these numbers start out strong and then start to taper a little bit as the month winds down. Okay, excellent. Sounds like it's going great. It is. And you know what? We've got some interesting stats that have been happening. Uh, things like we took a quick glance at the month of January, um, and it looks like we've had over 100,000 QSO matches. In other words, both stations have uploaded their um, contacts through Logbook of the World, and throughout the process of matching, confirming grid squares, there's been over 100,000 matches. Keep in mind that in order to be a match, your station location must have your grid square in it when you do your upload. Very good. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, with Amateur Radio History Headlines. 1933 and 1934. The Communications Act of 1934 creates the Federal Communications Commission. 
Amateur licenses are reorganized into Class A, Class B, and Class C. Major Edwin Armstrong develops wideband FM. 1936, H.P. Maxim, the founder of the ARRL and its first president, dies. 1938, the Cairo Conference. Amateurs lose the exclusive use of 40 meters, now shared with the broadcasters. The FCC gives us two new UHF bands, the two and a half meter band at 112 megacycles and the one and a quarter meter band at 224 megacycles. 1939 through 1940. We are joined in the UHF range by two new users. The first FM broadcast band, which ran from 42 to 50 megacycles and featured stations such as W1XPW, W2XMN, and W2XOY, and the first television broadcast band above 60 megacycles with stations such as W2XBS. 1940 through 1941. With the war raging in Europe, our ability to have international QSOs is severely limited. When the U.S. enters the war, all amateur activity is suspended. 1942 through 1945. Except for WERS, the War Emergency Radio Service, on two and a half meters, no amateur operations take place. New UHF tubes and circuits are developed as a result of the war. This has been Amateur Radio History Headlines with Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for This Week in Amateur Radio. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. The time is now 2 a.m. in Bakaba, Belgian Congo the home of the Jungle Telegraph. We'd like to say hello to Oongat Oonga Oomp and Mrs. Oomp and all the boys up at the transmitter. Sounds like, you know, sounds like a, you know, hype. The technology that's changing our lives next. No, it is really changing our lives though, isn't it? I mean, it's subtle and it's slow, but if you think about what life was like before ATMs, before email, before you had a computer in your pocket that was always connected to the internet, even facts, you know, even, <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't, you used to have debates over facts. No, Ar Arnold Palmer retired at the age of 72. He, he definitely did. No, I played in the Masters at 73. Now, normal, in the old days, <laughs> pre-internet, you'd have to go to the library, find a book and look it up to solve that debate. Now it's not you ask Siri or you ask Google or you ask Amazon and boom, the answer's done. There's no questions anymore. Everything's available instantly. It's kind of cool, but it but it's subtle, right? So you forget the, how we used to, we used to, used to have to go to the library to get this stuff or maybe you had an encyclopedia. I keep just for old times sake, I keep a world book encyclopedia in my office. <laughs> and I just look at it. <laughs> I grew when I grew up as a kid, you know, you had to have one of those because that's, you know, you had to have a reference work so you could answer some questions anyway. You know, we'd be at the dinner table having an argument. Dad would say, "Well, go look it up and go get the world book. Look it up in your encyclopedia, your twenty-six volume encyclopedia of the world." There, those businesses are gone. There's no world book anymore. There's, no, I guess, Britannica kind of is around, but it's more of a website, isn't it? And do you really need a separate Britannica website? You've got Google. Of course, now <laughs> the internet facts mean something else. I mean, <laughs> there are there are facts, there are alternative facts, there are fake facts, there are unreal facts, there are real facts, there are all kinds of facts. So now we have a different challenge, and that's what happens, isn't it? The new technologies change things. They don't uh, they don't eliminate uh, the challenges. They just change the challenges. So now it's no longer difficult to get facts. It's difficult to determine if a fact is true because you have so many sources. That's the and I don't know if education is catching up with this. For a long time, education still taught you how to research facts. You know, you go to school and you'd learn how to use the library and write a bibliography. You still need to write a bibliography, I guess. But uh, the new the new education would be how to not only how to use the internet to find what you want. Okay, that takes about three seconds. But then how to determine if the source you're using is any good. That's what we, that's what we need to learn. 
and the critical thinking to not just assume that everything you read is true. Does that make sense? That doesn't make sense. Let me see if I can find another source. Let me see if I can figure out if that's true or not. We need to learn that. That's really important. Do you know, do you notice if you spend less time or more time on the phone? Some of us spend very little time. I'm one of them. I don't, I never liked using the phone ever. I, I grew up at exactly the right time because now I don't have to. <laughs> I don't, I never liked making phone calls, but now I can text, I can email. But somebody once said, the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And I think that's exactly what you see a little bit and what we see on the show a little bit. It's William, the great science fiction author, William Gibson. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So some of us don't use the phone to make phone calls anymore. For some of us, the smartphone is not a phone at all. It's an internet connected device. And you probably know people, maybe you are one of them, who love making phone calls, live on the phone still. I think back to the movie. Remember the movie Bye Bye Birdie? When is that? When did that come out? The 50s? There's a great scene in there where they're all on the phone and the, you know, it's teenagers wrapped around the cords all wrapped around them. They're on the phone, you know, the girl and her, her pedal pushers, you know, kicking her heels as she's talking to her friend on the phone for hours and hours. You remember that? If you're of a certain age, you remember, <laughs> you remember mom getting on the phone, get off the line. I'm expecting a call. Mom. And if you were really, you know, affluent, maybe you'd get your own phone line and your own phone in your own room. Wow. Wow, that was a fancy person. Maybe a princess phone. That was a fancy person. Kids stay connected. Yes, they st they sure do. Uh, but they're often they've got Skype running. I see. <laughs> I see uh, kids. You know, teenagers now. They have they're doing their homework on their laptop. They've got a Skype window open with their other friends, four or five of them in the window doing their homework. They're kind of like. They're studying together, but they're all in different places. Maybe they also have a, a messenger window open, a text window open, and they're typing messages all at the same time. Probably they got the TV on too, right? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Nobody watches TV. YouTube. They had YouTube running in the background. That's where their music's coming from. So that's what the show's about. It's, a, it's the changing landscape. People are the same. People haven't changed much. But what we do has changed a lot. And what we need to know has changed even more. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? Computer security programs, this has all changed. And I know people are very skeptical when I say this. But I, if you're running Windows 8 or 10, I'll include 7 even, or a Mac OS computer of a recent vintage, I don't recommend security software. Uh, both operating systems come with their own security software, which is reliable and effective, and all you need. Only 5% of current viruses are detected by an antivirus in the first day or two. That's what's changed, by the way. You know, of course, I used to recommend antiviruses all the time, but that's what's changed. Viruses spread. Malware spreads now. You've heard the term zero day. That means they take zero days. They're discovered, these flaws, and exploited within 24 hours, far faster than any antivirus company can respond. They don't even know about it. So a, a security program has some real serious issues in the sense that it gives you a false sense of security. It's it's not 100% protection. All right, you might say, but I still, you know, I'm still getting whatever, 5%. Yeah, but what's the cost? Security software in your system slows it down, uses up resources, and most importantly, opens up holes. This is something really important. Every single program you put on your computer brings with it the potential for opening a door to a bad guy. If there's a flaw in that program, bad guys will take advantage of it and try to get in your system. So put as few programs on your system as you can. Don't put extra stuff on your system that you don't need or you don't use. Get rid of it. And when I say system, I mean your phone. I mean your laptop. I mean your desktop. I mean any computing device. Don't put additional software that you don't need on there. And what is really to be avoided is system-level software. Software that puts its hooks into the operating system, that checks memory that is not normally available to user programs. And, and antiviruses are the kings of this. Even though Microsoft has said and again and again, don't do that, they do. And so as a result, we have seen in the last year, three or four occasions where well-known antiviruses have simply been a gateway to bad guys. Just come on in. Bad guys love antiviruses. Bad guys 
love antiviruses. They're hoping you're running an antivirus on there. It's, it's a pathway to your deepest roots of your operating system. It doesn't protect you or has some limited protection, not doesn't fully protect you, opens avenues of attack, slows your system down, uses up memory, and gives you a false sense of security. This is why I don't recommend it. Useless, waste of time, waste of energy. Your computers are always being attacked. That's why you should never just put a computer on the open internet. You should always put it behind a router. Almost everybody does, because if you want to use more than one device on your internet connection, you have to. The good news is when somebody's attacking you, the only thing they see is the router. And and most routers just ignore any traffic they don't understand. They're dumb boxes. Going, I don't know what you're talking about. What? You want to attack my printer? Forget it. I don't even know what a printer is. They just ignore it. They throw it away. And so they, they're actually firewalls. They protect your inside network against the outside world. But they're always being attacked. If you if you could log the what's going on in your router, there's internet background radiation from attackers all the time. It's always happening. It's not unusual. It's best not to <laughs> worry too much about this stuff. You know, we talked yesterday, and I, I will reiterate, uh, the most important thing, update your software, use strong passwords, don't install software you don't need, be very careful where you get your software from, get it from well-known companies, and this is really true on a smartphone, even more so. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. This is the Rain Report for February 3rd. I'm Larry McGlore, KB9DIP. It seems that everywhere one turns today, there are lawyers rewriting or trying to rewrite modern and not so modern law. Telecommunications lawyer Fred Hopengarten, K1VR, has carved out a career of legal assistance for U.S. hams to circumvent CCRs. Common Covenants and Restrictions that Prevent So Many Radio Amateurs from Erecting Reasonable Outdoor Antennas. The federally mandated PRB1 legislation has been of some help in doing so for a number of years. However, as Fred pointed out in his 2017 Dayton Hamvention Amateur Radio and the Law Talk, there are 23 states that do not presently have a PRB1 style statute within the state. But I want you to listen closely to what I'm about to say, even if you live in one of the other states that has an existing PRB1 style state statute, because your local amateur community may decide to get ambitious and seek modifications of the present statute along the lines that I've presented here with respect to some of these concepts. The existing PRB1 eventually wound up as uh, 47 CFR section 9715B. That's the Code of Federal Regulations. These have all the power of a statute. Basically, it has three parts. Must not preclude. If there's an absolute prohibition on amateur radio, it's absolutely preempted. And then two other parts, which are referred to as a limited preemption, which is that they must reasonably accommodate amateur radio and represent the minimum practicable regulation. Minimum practicable, not the maximum allowable, which is what many communities aim for. In addition to that, there is a ruling, DA uh, stands for Distributed Authority. In other words, one of the bureaus at the FCC was given the power to create a ruling with the power of the FCC. And uh, this particular ruling in 1999, which is why it begins with 99- also says that a balancing of interests that is, balancing the community's interests with the interests of the radio ham is forbidden. And finally, that the regulations must, and I'm quoting, not impinge on the needs of amateur operators. Let's a, propose a new state statute. This was written for Arizona. I assure you it's the kind of thing that would work everywhere I can think of in the United States. First of all, you have to give it a, an enticing title. I'm a lawyer, I'm loquacious, I prefer the longer form title, but you could go with the shorter form. It doesn't matter because the active part of the statute is not the title, it's the active part. First, I would define the intent, and the intent would be to meet the need, and this is based on the paragraph 25 of PRB1, which says that 
a radio amateur is entitled to the effective communications that he or she desires. So I've just shortened that into meet the need. We want to mention effective communications that he or she desires to engage in. These are the words straight from P the original PRB1. I'm not making this up, folks. This is already federal law. So there should be no objection to writing it into a state law because after all, federal law is the supreme law of the land. I would define amateur radio this way and I would not define it as many states currently do as holders of FCC issued amateur radio licenses and here's the reason I want to be friendly to our friends from Canada who vacation in Florida they are authorized users but not licensed by the FCC and I think that we'd like to be nice to them. We also have a lot of people from South America who are homeowners in Arizona, Texas, Florida, Georgia, lots of places. Some of them have ski homes. I'd like those radio hams who are our brothers and sisters in pursuit of the hobby to have the same kind of privilege as we have. And the fact that they are not presently holding an FCC license should not forbid them to put up an amateur radio antenna because they're duly authorized to operate amateur radio. This comes from an old Minnesota case from 1944 of all things. Guy had two lots, house on one, antenna on the other, and he wound up in litigation because the antenna was the principal use of the second lot. So I want to get rid of this requirement that it be the principal use. There is also law in New York and other jurisdictions which says approximately the same thing, but this particular case, Village of St. Louis Park versus Casey, involved the perfect set of facts. Radio ham, house on one lot, antenna on another. I presently have a case in New York where the guy's house is on a lot within a very large parcel. His antennas are in the rest of the parcel, the house is in the house lot parcel, and the city's going bonkers because even though the house and the antennas are all on the 90 acres he owns, the antennas are not on the house lot parcel. That's why this paragraph exists in the state statute. And again, it's not a new idea. Here, all I'm doing is writing in PRB 1, uh, paragraph 25, to say that the test is not the communications that any rogue radio ham might wish. The guy who only wants to talk with his HT on two meters, he has effective communications that he desires, but the guy who wants to get on 40 meter JT65 can't because he can't put up a decent antenna that's in any way going to be effective for the communications he desires. I had a case in Washington, the state of Washington, where a guy couldn't put his antenna all on his own lot. The gentleman here in the fourth row, fifth row, had a comparable situation. He had permission from his neighbor for his antenna to rotate over the property line. So this is not theoretical. We have a guy right here in the audience who has lived through this exact situation. And I'm saying that if you have the written consent of your neighbor to let your antenna encroach on his property, or in the case where you own two lots side by side, and you're encroaching on yourself, you ought to be able to give yourself permission to encroach on yourself. I don't think this is a big stretch of logic, frankly. I want to make it plain that especially for people who have the room to put it up, you're not limited to just one structure. And stealing from an Alaska statute, Alaska 29.35, if you want to put up new structures and you have at least 10,000 square feet per structure, you should be able to put it up as a matter of right. Again, since I'm borrowing from another state statute, this is not new. We're not inventing anything. Not asking for a big stretch of the elastic band. And by the way, I also had no limit to the number of antennas as long as they're attached to your house. So you want three or four whips on the rooftop, no problem. Uh, I've run into that problem too in my practice. And because the federal law already says that balancing is not permitted, I'm writing it into the state statute. Not a stretch of the imagination. And I'm incorporating the existing law of PRB1 as written, but I'm adding one small thing. The FCC has already written that onerous fees 
are not reasonable accommodation. I'm just writing it into the statute. As with many permitting things, I want to get the ham out from under the burden of persuasion. If the city wants to burden this property, let them have the burden. Now, states like North Carolina and Virginia, anybody here from North Carolina or Virginia? Which one? North Carolina has a very strong property owner's rights history of law in the state. So this would be almost an automatic under North Carolina law, just to point that out to you. But I'll tell you, we had a terrible time in Mecklenburg County. I had to keep a guy out of jail. And uh, because of a case that Bob and I are presently litigating, I want to make sure that it's absolutely plain that if the radio ham has to bring a lawsuit, he can bring it in either state or federal court. That's all. It was obvious until last year, and then the Third Circuit said it's not so obvious and you have to bring it in state court first. That's not the case in six other circuits of the United States, but not the Third Circuit. So I want to incorporate this in a new statute passed anywhere. And dealing with the questions we've already had about grandfathering, I want all antenna structures built before the new zoning bylaw to be exempt from subsequent changes in a zoning bylaw. In other words, I'm writing the concept of grandfathering, which is not a new or novel concept, into this new proposed state statute. And I borrowed this from Kansas Statutes Annotated 12-16,126G. Any people from Kansas here? Nobody from Kansas. I just had a lot of luck with N9GB and AC0C. They got their permits within the last couple of months. And that's a wrap on this RAIN report in which we featured Fred Hopengarten, K1VR, a telecommunications lawyer who wants to have every state incorporate a PRB1 style statute. I'm Larry McGlore, KB9DIP, bidding you very 73 from all of us connected with the Radio Amateur Information Network. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. Foundations of Amateur Radio. If you've ever been on the hunt for an antenna, and let's face it, in amateur radio that's pretty likely, you'll get information about the gain of an antenna. Often someone will tell you that this one has 12 dB gain versus that one which only has 9 dB. As an aside, I've seen a few videos where people are comparing sound levels and mention that without the fan, there's only 3 dB less noise. What they don't realize is that 3 dB means half the noise. The same is true with an antenna. That 9 dB antenna has half the gain of a 12 dB antenna. In the past I've talked about gain. It's always in comparison to something else. If I say that antenna has 12 dB gain, I'm actually saying that antenna has 12 dB gain when compared with an isotropic source. To jog your memory, an isotropic source is a theoretical source of electromagnetic radiation. It cannot actually exist. It radiates uniformly in all directions. Now when we talk about gain, we're saying that our new funky antenna radiates better in some or other direction than an isotropic source. As a consequence of this, it also means that it radiates worse in other directions. So antenna gain is a trade-off between radiating everywhere like an isotropic source and only radiating in one direction like a laser beam. As an aside, a laser beam could be seen as an antenna for light. It radiates much better in one direction than in any other, and given that light is also an electromagnetic radiation, we're still playing in the same area of physics. If you've ever shone a torchlight onto a wall, you'll have noticed that the light isn't uniform. There are brighter and darker areas. It's the equivalent of differences in gain. Some bits of the light are amplified more than other bits. If you compare it to something like a candle, not exactly an isotropic source, but remarkably close, you'll notice that the light is uniform. A torch doesn't shine from the rear. The energy from the light that's missing from the rear comes out the front, and that's gain. Radio antennas do the same thing. In order to compare antennas with each other, we've devised several tools. The most common is a polar plot. 
It's a circle that is divided into 360 degrees, and inside the circle are concentric circles with gain numbers attached to them. Often, but not always, the outside circle has 0 dB as a value, and you'll see minus 10 dB, minus 20 dB, and so on as you get closer to the middle. Weaker signal is drawn away from the outer edge, stronger towards the edge. No signal in the middle. As you walk around your torch, you could record the strength of the light. Where it's strongest, you make a mark on the edge of the chart. Where it's weakest, you'd mark towards the centre of the chart. If you were to take your torch and take a slice through the middle of your battery, through the reflector, through the globe, through the lens and out to the wall, you'd end up with what a polar chart is displaying. Of course, you can slice through your torch in any direction and make a chart, but traditionally you'd slice it horizontally and vertically, or azimuth and elevation. And if you can't remember which one is which, an elevator goes up. A torch is generally symmetric, so both charts should be the same, unless your reflector is a weird shape at which point the two charts will likely be different. Antenna charts work the same way. The polar graph is showing the signal strength as you walk around the antenna, twice. Once for the horizontal slice, and once for the vertical one. As I said, the outer edge of the chart is set at 0 dB. This is because you need to compare full signal to less signal. If you're comparing multiple antennas and they all have the same zero point, you can draw them over the top of each other and see their differences. This allows you to compare wildly different antennas with vastly different amounts of gain. I must also point out that you can get more signal strength in two ways. More gain from the antenna, but also more power into the antenna. This means that your choice of antenna is dependent on what gain you want and how much you're prepared to pay for it. I could light up an omnidirectional antenna with 300 kilowatts or I could use a very high gain antenna and use 5 watts. It all depends on your purpose. Final comment. Beam width of an antenna, the main direction of radiation, is often based on where the signal strength is half, so 3 dB less than the maximum gain. That location will determine the angle. Remember, the chart is expressed in 360 degrees, so you'll be able to see the beam width on the same chart. Polar charts, lots of hidden meaning inside a pretty picture. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot, Lima, Alpha, Bravo. The ALL Foundation has announced a new scholarship, the Joel R. Miller W7PDX and Martha C. Miller STEM Scholarship. Endowed through the generosity of Joel R. Miller W7PDX and Martha C. Miller, this scholarship is intended to supplement the educational expenses of an amateur radio operator pursuing higher education. The ARRL Foundation will administer the scholarship, which is $1,000 annually to fund the costs of tuition, books, fees, and other educational expenses. The first scholarship from this endowment will be awarded in 2019. Applicants must be a U.S. citizen without regard to gender, race, national origin, or handicap status, residing in the ARRL Northwestern Division encompassing Alaska, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, and Washington. Those applying must be pursuing an associate's or higher degree in the fields of science, technology, engineering, or mathematics at an accredited institution of higher education and have a 3.0 or higher grade point average at a high school or an accredited institution of higher education for the academic year immediately prior to the application period. The ARRL Foundation Scholarship Committee will submit its nomination to the ARRL Foundation Board of Directors to approve by majority vote. The board will disperse the scholarship funds to the winner's school of choice. The Joel R. Miller W7PDX and Martha C. Miller STEM scholarship will be endowed with a gift of $25,000. Earnings on the endowment will fund the annual scholarship award. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. We have another new satellite in orbit. It is D-Star 1 Phoenix using the call sign Delta Papa 1 Golf Oscar Sierra. It is a 3U CubeSat equipped with four identical radio modules, all D-Star capable. It has two amateur half-duplex repeaters on board as well as a beacon. Both are operating on a downlink of 435.525 MHz and uplink 
of 437.325 MHz. One repeater will be operational and the other powered off. They retranslate the received D-Star frames on the downlink frequency. They also have a D-Star voice beacon signal. They operate in a power save mode. They will be idle for 40 seconds, then in receive mode for 20 seconds. Once receiving a signal, the module switch to receive mode for five minutes. It might be necessary to ping the satellite a couple of times until there is an answer. Thanks to the D-Star 1 Project website for this week's news. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. The CQDX Hall of Fame and the CQ Contest Hall of Fame recognize those amateurs who have made major contributions to DXing and contesting, respectively. The CQ Amateur Radio Hall of Fame recognizes those who have made major contributions to amateur radio as a whole and radio amateurs who have made significant contributions to society at large. The activities and accomplishments that qualify one for membership in these elite groups involves considerable personal sacrifice and can usually be described by the phrase above and beyond the call of duty. Nominations to any of the Halls of Fame may be made by individuals, clubs, or national organizations and must be submitted by March 1st of each year to be considered. A maximum of two people may be inducted into the contest and DX Halls of Fame every year. There is no set maximum for inductees into the Amateur Radio Hall of Fame. Nominations may be emailed to the Hall of Fame at cq-amateur-radio.com or mailed to CQ Amateur Radio, DX, or Contest Hall of Fame, care of CQ Magazine, 17 West John Street, Hicksville, New York, 11801. Be sure to specify for which Hall of Fame the nomination is made. Again, the deadline for receiving email nominations is March 1, 2018. Mailed nominations must be postmarked by March 1, 2018. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the propagation forecast for Friday, February 9th. We have a single sunspot that's rotated into view, and this one has been showing a fair amount of instability. In fact, on February 7th, it produced a Class C flare that shut down the bands below 20 meters for a while. According to the forecast, we can expect more flares out of this spot over the next several days. In addition to flares, we've been receiving a glancing blow from a stream of solar particles. This may also cause some instability this weekend, just in time for the CQ Worldwide RIDI contest. On VHF and UHF, there have been some tropospheric band openings across the southern tier of the United States, ranging from California all the way to Florida. The strongest seem to be taking place from northern Florida northeast into Georgia and South Carolina. Two meter operators in particular should be on alert. The Sisterhood of Amateur Radio, or SOAR, in conjunction with the Girl Scout Council of Southern Nevada, hosted a radio and wireless tech field day on February 3rd in Las Vegas for more than 60 girls and their adult chaperones. ARRL began offering its radio and wireless technology patch program for Girl Scouts in 2016. The program defines the requirements for Girl Scouts to earn the patch at the Brownie, Junior, Cadet, Senior, and Ambassador levels and provides a platform for participants to learn about wireless technology, including amateur radio, and to inspire girls to learn the fundamentals of radio communication and wireless technology. It also prompts participants to take action in their communities to apply their newfound knowledge to connect people, provide safety, and to kindle an interest in science, technology, engineering, and math subjects and careers. In addition to hands-on activities, the Girl Scouts in Las Vegas also learned about emergency and public service communications and explored ways wireless technology is used in everyday life and in the workplace. The SOAR participants enthusiastically shared what it means to be an amateur radio operator and demonstrated how they can communicate around the world via amateur radio. As a girl-led and girl-focused organization, Girl Scouts of Southern Nevada understands the importance of providing science and engineering educational programming to girls of all ages, said Linda Bridges, Chief of Communications for Girl Scouts of Southern Nevada. By partnering with SOAR, we look forward to inspiring all Girl Scouts to pursue a lifelong love of communication and global goodwill. 
Highlights of the event were spelling out their name in Morse code and hearing it via a code practice oscillator, learning about antenna directivity and participating in a fox hunt, and actually talking on the radio as well as using voice over internet protocol modes. ARRL Nevada Section Manager John Bigley, N7UR, expressed appreciation for the contribution of all the participants who took time out of their day to speak to the girls to demonstrate to them what amateur radio can do to connect people around the world. ARRL this week announced a mobile DXCC operating award available to radio amateurs who have contacted at least 100 DXCC entities from a working vehicle with antennas and power source capable of operating while in motion. ARRL Radio Sport Manager Norm Fusaro, W3IZ, advised those pursuing the award to put safety first. Distracted driving is a serious concern and we hope all mobile operators exercise care when operating from a moving vehicle, he said. Full official details are on the Mobile DXCC Operating Awards page. The Mobile DXCC is a one-time award and is non-endorsable. Contacts at any time in the past do count towards the award. QSLs are required, but you need not submit them. Mobile stations may use any legal power for the entity from which they're operating. This award specifically excludes contacts made by aeronautical or maritime mobile stations. You do not have to be an ARRL member to qualify. Because this award is similar to the QRP DXCC Operating Award, ARRL has redesigned the QRP DXCC Certificate so that the two awards complement one another. Operators who hold the QRP DXCC award may apply for the all-new style certificate with the original date of issue printed on the certificate, but you do not have to resubmit QSL cards or a log. All certificates are $16. And finally this week, the future has arrived. We have flying cars. After launching the world's largest rocket, the SpaceX Heavy, with a Tesla Roadster and Spaceman at the wheel into Earth orbit for all of us to enjoy last week, Elon Musk is at it again, as it was just announced that in the very near future, at least for one or two months, the night sky will also be an art museum. The Nevada Museum of Art and artist Trevor Paglin will be launching a 100 foot long satellite into space in mid 2018 and people around the world will be able to see it for themselves, whether they have a telescope or not. The heavens bound artwork will launch on a rocket owned by Elon Musk's SpaceX company. The sculpture called the orbital reflector is expected to orbit the earth about once every 90 minutes. At least in North America, we know that we'll be able to see it about four times in a night. Nevada Museum of Art Communications Director Amanda Horn told Newsweek. It will only be visible when the sun reflects off the balloon-like diamond for a few hours immediately after dusk and before dawn. Eventually, the satellite, which is made by Global Western, will fall out of orbit and burn up in the atmosphere. On a side note, Uber Mars should be getting going in about a couple of months. Sources on the internet. The Radio Amateurs of Canada, AMSAT, the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, National and International Amateur Radio Newsletters, the FCC, the RSGB, Q News, the CGC Communicator, RAIN, sources on the internet, and the AX.25 Amateur Packet Network have provided many of the news and information items heard on today's edition of this Week in Amateur Radio. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like the Benton County Radio Operators Club repeater system on 145.290 MHz and 443.025 MHz in Northwest Arkansas following the Thursday evening BCRO repeater system 7 p.m. net. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.